Heavenly Lord, we, above, we give you the praise, we give you the glory. We give you thanks, Lord, that you give us the freedom to meet here each and every Sunday. That we can be ourselves, Lord. That this is a wonderful place to get to know you better. To expand our knowledge, to expand our love in you. And as it says in this song that we just sang, so you would come. All you want from us, Lord, you want our trouble. You want our sin. You want our pain. You want it all. But most of all, you want our love. We give you praise. We give you thanks, Lord. We pray for the message this afternoon. That it will be one, Lord, that will be pleasing to you. And it will be your words. We thank you so much, Lord, and we pray all this in the name of our living Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Thank God for the ongoing blessings that come from Him. And as I've often said, we don't go to heaven with a bunch of U-Hauls behind us. What we have here, we leave here. And as God blesses us, we use what we have to bless others as well. And that will be part of the message today on service, on how we are to serve God. And ask that we found a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have to serve you. We thank you that you've called us not just to come and to bow our knees and come into that faith relationship with you as Savior, but you've also called us to a life of service, of humble service, that our words and our lives may bring honor to you. You've not called us to sit back and to do nothing for the kingdom. You've not called us to work our way into heaven and gain salvation through our works, but You've called us, when we come to faith in you, to do works of service for the kingdom. Lord, forgive us at times when we become lazy, when we become indifferent, when we put other things before you. Help us to understand our responsibilities from your word as to what you have called us to be, what you've called us to do and what our responsibilities are in the short time that we have here on this earth. We ask that you may bring honor to you alone, that you may anoint your servant as this message comes forth, and that you may receive the glory through this message today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The message today is called Crowning Service. Crowning Service. When we think of a crown, what comes to mind are the elaborate gold and jewel covered crowns put on the heads of a king or a queen. In reference to crowns mentioned in the New Testament, Paul is thinking of crowns of flowers put on the heads of contestants running in the Ispian Games, which were similar to the Olympic Games that we celebrate today. Instead of perishable crowns, like these crowns of flowers and vines that were put on those who won at the Isthmian Games, crowns that would quickly pass away. Paul is talking about imperishable, eternal crowns given out one day in future to acknowledge the faithful servants of Christians in this life on earth. And these crowns will never pass away. Did you know that one day each one of us will be acknowledged before the heavenly host as to what we have done in service for the King of Kings? Do you realize that? That's right. That we have expectations put upon us. That when we come to God, we don't sit and keep the seats warm. We have a call to service. And one day, that service will be acknowledged by eternal crowns. Now, this isn't often preached on. 
but it's in Scripture. There are five heavenly crowns mentioned for believers in Scripture. The first crown is called the imperishable crown. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 25. And this crown is given to those who are faithful in serving God, who do not give up. Do you know there are times it can be discouraging as a Christian? There are times that even Christians will get to the point of saying, what's the point? That there are times that Christians will even be like Elijah and say, who else is faithful but me? And Elijah got depressed and suicidal. At times as Christians, we can get to the point of saying, what's the point? I, am I the only faithful one here who is taking the word of God seriously? Who is living a life that's honoring to God? Sometimes as Christians, we can see friends who wear the label Christian who are not living as Christians. And we can get discouraged and say, am I the only one? I've been praying for my father, I've been praying for my mother, I've been praying for my neighbor, I haven't seen anything we can get discouraged. Adonijah Jackson, who was a missionary, was called to the country of Burma, which is now Myanmar. And he labored 12 years and saw nothing. But he was faithful to what God had called him to do, and he faithfully kept promoting and presenting the Word of God for 12 years. And in the 12th year, the first Burmese came to Christ under his ministry. There will be the imperishable crown given out for those who are faithful, who keep on going for God, whether they see something happen or not. Paul says we go by faith and not by sight. We have been called to serve God whether we see anything happening as a result of our faithful service or not. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. What is this saying? Paul is saying, if you are serving God, serve God with all that you have. Go for gold. Put your utmost into serving God. Don't sit back. And there are too many Christians in too many churches who think they are entitled before God for God to bless them. God owes me. They're not running for God. They're running for themselves. We're living in too many churches that are so self-centered and have such an attitude before God that is not biblical at all. <clears throat> Right in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. How often are Christians not taking their faith seriously? Not spending time in prayer. Not spending time in the Word of God. Not spending time sharing their faith. Not spending time in helping others. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. How serious are we about serving God? I've said in the past that our nation is changing so much. Do not be surprised in future that you may face persecution. God has called you to be faithful now. Are you going to wait until you do not have the time to serve God freely? Because the society has changed so much that there are restrictions on what you can do to serve God? Are we going to wait until it's too late? The imperishable crown. The second is in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, the crown of rejoicing. Are we living for joy? I've been to churches where I think that they had a discount on the sale of lemons. Because people have said, it looks like everyone came into church eating a piece of lemon. <laughs> they think, where's the joy? It's like people have dragged themselves there and they're going through the ritual and putting in their, in their time for God. I put in my one hour. I've earned my brownie point for the week. 
And they drag themselves over to the, over the church. Where is the joy of the Lord? It says the joy of the Lord is my strength. Are we rejoicing? Paul says we give thanks in everything, not for everything. Where do you have that attitude of gratitude? Here is a crown. A crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when He comes, is it not you? Do you not think that God has joy in those who serve Him with joy? Are we serving God with grudging obligation? Oh, I'd better serve the God of judgment in the sky because if I don't, woo, I'm in trouble. Where is the joy? The crown of rejoicing will be available. The third is the crown of righteousness. Second Timothy 4.8 This calls believers to live a life of integrity and purity. Now this is a tough one in North American society where it's anything goes. Where we live in an immoral society, we do. You see it all around you where the moral and ethical standards are going down, 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 down. They haven't hit bottom yet. We have become so influenced by the world one of the greatest sins in the Christian church today is pornography. Because it's so easy to go online. Who's going to know? Now I'm visiting these sites. And that's for male and female. No longer restricted just to male. We've been called to live a life of integrity. When people say that person is a member of that church and a member of God's kingdom, he, I can, or she, I can trust. Are we people that, that can be trusted? That people look to us, I can do business with that person because I know they're trustworthy. I know they won't talk against me. I know they won't backbite. I know they won't betray me. I have been betrayed by Christians in my life. Some of them leaders. In the church. It says within the church that Christians are, are the only ones that kill their walking wounded. Are we people to be trusted? We live a life of integrity and purity. 2 Timothy 4 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Jesus is coming back as a thief in the night. He's coming back for people that are prepared. Your life better be prepared every day. Because Jesus could come back today. One person once said that he had one finger in the newspaper and one finger in the Bible for prophecy. <laughs> Looking at what's happening in, in the world today. We could be living in the last time. You see Russia in the, in the Middle East? You see things that are happening today. You see the United Nations saying Israel has no history on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The United Nations denying not only the biblical right of Israel and the historical presence of the Jewish people on the Temple Mount, but saying that the Jewish people have no history there. And that implies that we as Christians have no history because Jesus was in the Temple Mount. He was in the Temple. So the UN saying this is not relevant and never happened. It's saying what's in our New Testament in relation to Jesus never happened when he went into the Temple. They're basically they're saying, they're saying hey, it wasn't there. Not relevant. You see what's happening in the world today. We need to take heed as Christians. No, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. He said only the Father knows. He doesn't know. When God the Father will send him as a thief in the night, but we are to be ready. Fourth is the crown of glory. 1 Peter 5 and verse 4. Oh, 
was longing for the return of Jesus. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Are you looking forward to the return of Jesus? Are you excited that Jesus is coming back? That we could be like Elijah and not know death? Elijah didn't die. He had a chariot sent to him. He was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. He didn't know death. Jesus is coming back. We may be alive and here when he returns. And we will be caught up into his presence. So that's not something to look forward to. It's not something to look forward to for those who don't know the Lord. Because if you look at the Revelation, it's not going to be a nice place here. It says there will be judgment on this earth. And one day there will be a new heavens and a new earth. The old will pass away. It will be destroyed by fire. There are heavy times coming down the pike. But for those who are committed to Jesus Christ, they have nothing to fear. The crown of glory. Five is the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. This talks to those who resist temptation even to the point of death. The martyr's crown. How committed are you to Jesus? He purchased your life. We have no right to our life anymore. He paid a debt he did not owe. He paid his life so that we might have entrance and acceptance into the family of God. We have no more right to this life. And even as I speak, there are Christians in jail. There are Christians who are dying for their faith. Just because they're Christian. Right now, in some part of the world. And yet here, when we are asked, oh, are you a Christian? We are almost ashamed of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. How tragic it is that here in North America, the church has fallen into a state that brings dispute upon the name of God. God will only allow corruption to get, go so far in society and within His church. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. God is withholding His judgment. He will withhold it only so long. And then it will come. The crown of life is Revelation 2.10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of, of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. These crowns are all involving faithfully serving God by word and deed. Crowns are not going to be given out to people who just... Wear the label Christian and just, just say, hey, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I don't have to do anything more. End of story. Uh-uh. When we come to personal faith in Christ, that is the beginning. No, we're not saved by works. When we come to personal faith in Christ, out of the joy of serving Him, we do works for the kingdom. Amen. And one day, those who are faithfully serving Him will be acknowledged in heaven with eternal crowns that will be given up. Can you just imagine Christians who are faithfully serving God and they're given a crown and they have an opportunity to take that crown and put it at the feet of Jesus? I don't serve God to get a crown. I serve God to cut for years. I don't care whether I get a crown. What I care about is, am I being faithful to, to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Look at these crowns as an extra bonus. Look at uh, serving in a restaurant, and you're, you've got your wage, and then you serve a, a couple, and your service is really good, and you come back to the table, and you find out they've given you a hundred dollar tip. That's a bonus. 
but you served without expecting that hundred dollar tip. We have been called to serve God. But these crowns are there as bonuses. Amen? They're bonuses for service. Just think how sad it would be in heaven for those who receive no crowns. Who are not acknowledged for service because there was no service. There was no commitment. There was no involvement. Do we serve for self or do we serve for the Savior? The self-righteous service comes through human effort. True service comes from a relationship with God deep inside. Self-righteous service is impressed with the big deal. True service finds it almost impossible to distinguish the small from the large. Self-righteous service requires eternal rewards. True service rests contented in hiddenness. Self-righteous service is highly concerned about results. True service is free of the need to calculate results. We're not to look at what is happening. God knows. We're to be faithful in serving. Self-righteous service picks and chooses whom to serve. True service is indiscriminate in its ministry. We serve everyone. It is a tragedy that there are churches today that if you're not dressed in the right way, you're not welcome. There have been some churches where pastors would dress up in certain ways and come into the church as a homeless person to test the church. And some pastors have found their own church has failed the test. Self-service is affected by moods and whims. True service ministers simply and faithfully because there is a need. Do we only serve God when we feel like it? We're in a society now within the church that's based on feelings. I feel good. I will serve God if I feel like doing it. I will pray if I feel like praying. I will read God's Word if I feel like reading God's Word. We are based in a society and within the church too much dependence on feelings. And feelings can lead us astray. We know what God has called us to do. Whether we feel like it or not, are we ready to be obedient to what he's called us to do? True self-service, self-righteous service is temporary. True service is a lifestyle. Do we have that servant mentality to serve God no matter what? To do whatever he calls us to do, no matter what, not temporary? Are you in it for the long haul? Are you only serving God for what you get? You're coming to God with conditions. God, I will serve you if you come through for me materially. If you come through for me in a way that makes me feel good. We bargain with God, put conditions on serving God. God puts conditions on us in how He expects us to serve Him. Self-righteous services without sensitivity insist on meeting the need even when to do so would be destructive. True service can withhold the service as freely as performing. Self-righteous service fractures community. True service, on the other hand, builds community. We're here to serve one another as well as to serve those in the community. The great violinist Nicola Paganini, Paganini Willed his marvelous violin to Genoa, the city of his birth, but only on condition that the instrument never be played upon. It was an unfortunate condition, for it is the peculiarity of wood that as long as it is used and handled, it shows little wear. As soon as it was discarded, it, be it begins to decay. The exquisite mellow tone violin has become worthy in its beautiful case, valueless except as a relic. The moldering instrument is a reminder that a life withdrawn from all service to others loses its meaning. We start, stop doing what God has called us to do, our fires of faith are going to start going out and start smoldering, and the fires are going completely. It 
A.T. Pearson in his book, The Truth, said, whatever is done for God without respect of its comparative character is related to other acts is service. And only that is service. Service is comprehensively speaking and doing the will of God. He is the object. All is for Him, for His sake, as unto the Lord, not as unto man. We are not serving in order for people to think we are so, such a great person. We're not doing acts of service for payback. We're not doing things for people to put us on a pedestal. Say, what a fine man or woman that is. Look what they are doing. A great way for our ego to get puffed out of all proportion. Hence, even the humblest act of humblest dis discipline and discipleship acquires a certain divine quality by it being done with reference to Jesus. The supreme test of service is this, for whom am I doing this? For God or for ourselves? Much that we call service to Christ is not such at all. If we are doing this for Christ, we shall not care for human reward or even recognition. Our work must again be tested by three prepositions. Number one, is it work from God as given us to do from Him? For God as finding in Him its secret of power and with God as only a part of His work in which we engage as co-workers with Him. What is our focus in serving others? Years ago, the Salvation Army was holding an international convention and their founder, General William Booth, could not attend because of physical weakness. He cabled his convention a message to them, and that message was one word, others. A life of service. I read recently the Good News translation of Proverbs 3, 27 to 28. This, this passage in this translation hit me. And Proverbs 3, 27 to 28 says, Whenever you possibly can, do good to those who need it. Never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow. If you can help them now. I had to read that translation verse several times. And I'll read it again. Whenever you possibly can, if you have the means, do good to those who need it. Never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. That's a tough verse. That's a sharp verse. It's often, oh, I, I, I've got the dishes to do, I've got this appointment, I've got this pro program to see. Uh, well, Mildred, you, you go home and uh, maybe I'll visit or call you tomorrow. <laughs> oh, but, but, but I don't have enough money to feed my kids tonight. Well, maybe tomorrow. I'll, I'll see whether I have enough money in my bank account. That's going against what this scripture is saying. Sometimes we have the means to help there and then. But we use excuses because we have other priorities in our time. There will be crimes for service, but also an accounting of what we have done at the judgment seat of Christ. Did you know that as a Christian you are going to go before God and give an account of what you've done in this life? Did you know that? You're not going to get away scot-free. You're not going to give an account as to whether your standing with God is right or not. This isn't salvation that's, that's going to be judged. This isn't the final judgment of the evil and the wicked. This is the judgment of God's people and a revealing before all the heavenly hosts. Can you imagine? You're up there before Jesus and you've got all the angels and all the heavenly hosts and the elders and the disciples and you're there before Jesus, and everything is going to be revealed as to what you've done or not for God in this life. We are all going to go through that one day. Not what I think. Mentioned in Scripture. 
We all go before the judgment seat of Christ. Works do not save us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says salvation is a gift, not of works, at least anyone who should boast. I'm not talking about works saving us. This is works coming out of our standing before God after we come to personal faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm hammering this because this is serious. And a lot of Christians don't take this seriously. We've been called to do good works and service to the King of Kings and Lords of Lords. In Philippians 2, 10 to 11, it says that one day at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is who we serve. Now one day, every, everything, every life form will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and he has called us to serve. Not an option. Not an option. Revelation 14, 10 to 12 says, For we will all, all, did you hear the word? All. For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. This is not me. This is in the word of God that we will give an account for what we have done or not done in this life. 2 like Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There it is, right in Scripture. All. All. We will all appear. That means you. Doesn't mean the person sitting next to you. Well, it does mean the person sitting next to you. But it also means you. For all. We must all be here, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body here and now. Whether good or bad, this is referring to Christians, not unbelievers. This is referring to you and me. The judgment seat of Christ therefore involves believers giving an account of their lives for Him in this life. Nothing you do is going to go unnoticed. And what you don't do is also not going to go unnoticed. The judgment seat of Christ does not determine salvation. That was determined by Christ's sacrifice on our behalf and our faith in Him. All of our sins have been forgiven. And we will never be condemned for them. Romans 8, 1. We should not look at the judgment seat of Christ as God judging our sins, but rather as God rewarding us for our lives of service. Rewarding us or not. We will all give account of what we have done. <coughs> the judgment seat of Christ, believers are rewarded based on how have served Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 4 to 27. Some of the things we might be judged on is how we have faith, whether we faithfully obeyed the Great Commission. Jesus has said, be my witnesses. Do you know that's not an option to share our faith in Christ? It's not an option. He said, go into the world. And that go includes you. And if you do not go and do not do what God has called you to do, you tell me how that is, cannot be called sin. If we disobey what God has called us to do, that is sin. Because sin is disobedience to God. So we may be judged in that particular area of how faithfully we've served us. How victorious we've been over sin. Sometimes even as Christians, we can have the little mini sins and just sort of, oh no, God won't notice this, this little sin I have of lying. God, God won't notice. I, I, I'm not paying my income tax on this particular little, little, little bit that I should be claiming, but, but who's going to notice? The government's rich, they won't miss it. We as Christians can justify sin. By saying, oh, God only is concerned about the big sins. 
These little ones don't matter. To God, sin is sin. Whether it's little or big, it is still sin. How well we control our tongues. It's a whole chapter in James about the tongue. The problem even within the churches is some Christians can't control their tongue. Oh, did you hear about Sally? Sally this week, she did this and this and this. Boy, I thought she was a Christian. No. You know what they're saying? They're saying, boy, Sally really blew it, but I am such a super superior Christian, I'm better than Sally. Mm -hmm. I'm glad Sally's getting, getting her image tarnished because I'm better than Sally. We can get into gossip in the church. Say things that we shouldn't say against even other believers. So there will be crowns given out for different ways of service. Faithful, faithfully serving Christ. As James 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who pers perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You in it for the long term? Are you serious about God? Or are you only in it for yourself? The Ernie Brady points. I grew up in a town, a small town. The church I went to, all the important people in the town went to that church. Police chief, mayor, people with money. I went to that church and there were certain pews in that church I couldn't sit in because those were family pews of important people. Those people put God first. People with the money were the people who were the leaders in the church. The church was focused on self. Focused on individuals as to who they were. Not for their standing before God. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, I mentioned this before, that it says our works of service will one day be judged as like a fire. Whether our works have been like wood, hay, or stubble after the fire, nothing but ash. Or whether they're like precious jewels after the fire, they still remain. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light and will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping the flames. Will we be in heaven one day? What we've done for God will be like a pile of ash. We will still have our standing before God, but no reward, no crown. Can you imagine being before Jesus and having your works and your life represented by a bunch of ash and be before your Savior who died for you on the cross and have to acknowledge before Him and before all the hosts of heaven that your life in serving Him has been wasted? True? We will all, all, individually be before God, be before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Did you know that even now, this is talking about at the end, all will be revealed, just as our, our names are in the book of life, those who have given their heart to Jesus. In personal faith, their names are written in the book of life. One day the book will be opened and the names will be revealed. This is beyond that. This is saying beyond that. What will be revealed is what we have done. Even though our names are in the book of life, what will be revealed is to what we have done or not done in serving God. But did you know that you are possibly even being tested right now? Do you know that you could be tested right now? In Hebrews 13, in verse 2, it says, Do not forget to show hospitality. Hospitality is serving others. Do 
Do, do, you, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. There are angels at different times in human form, not with wings, not with halos. <laughs> there are angels who take human form for particular reasons. And they're on earth. You have met angels. You probably, some of you may have met angels in your life as a Christian and not even known it. What is this saying? Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Do you know that sometimes in helping someone, that may have been an angel you helped? Do you ever really think about that? That that's an act of service that God will know right away. Because one of his representatives is here that you have served. And have helped. Final questions. Will you be shown to be victorious in the testing in this life? Or later, as to what type of service you have done for Jesus? Will you be wearing a crown for faithful service? Or will you be shedding tears in heaven because of a wasted life? This is a hard message. But it's in the Word. A lot of churches don't preach it. But this is the Word of God. Are we not called to live the whole truth of God? Not just bits and pieces that are comfortable? This is not comfortable. Because it challenges us in ways that we are falling short of serving God. It challenges us that we need to get more serious about serving Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. So where are you at this morning? Have you been faithfully serving God? One day, everything's going to be revealed. One day, each one of us will be before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will be called to give an account. We will still be in heaven. But we will be called to give account for what we have done or not done in this life. So if you have not been doing what you need to do under God in serving Him, then you need to get things in order. I pray that each one here has that personal faith commitment to Jesus Christ. Because if there's anyone here that does not, one day there will be a different type of judgment. The white throne judgment. The judgment of those who have rejected God and have no place for Jesus in their heart who have not become part of the family of God. That's a different type of judgment. And I pray there's no one here that will come under that judgment. But this morning, I'm focusing on believers. On us. The judgment seat of Christ. Are you faithfully serving Him? Without any thought of recognition? Don't any thought of anyone knowing that you've helped so-and-so? But doing it for the glory of God? You desire to serve Him no matter what? Even during the tough time, Jesus said it would not be easy to serve Him. It would not be easy to, de to deny ourselves and to take up the cross. It is tough to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's going to get tougher in this world. It's going to get tougher to be serious in following Jesus Christ. Yes, there will be crowns given out one day. But I pray that each one of us is serving God out of joy for what He has done in sending His Son to die for us. So where are you at today? Is God speaking to your heart that you're not living a life of service? You're not doing what God has called you to do. And many days you put yourself first. And God's way down at the end of the list. Because there are other priorities. Jesus has said to each one of us, follow me. Just like the disciples. They followed him. They left everything behind. They followed him totally. 
When we give our life to Jesus Christ, our life is a blank check. When we say, Lord, I signed it, you fill in the details. One of those details may be requiring us to give our lives for Him. I'm not saying we're all rushing out to be martyrs. I'm saying there are times when we take a stand for Christ, as Christians are in different countries. And they're called to give the ultimate sacrifice, their own lives, which they don't own any. Where do you stand before God? I'm not preaching on Halloween today. Because this is what God laid in my heart to preach today. And I obey God for the message that He caused me to preach. And this is the one that He laid in my heart and confirmed for this morning. For today. For a reason. Because I believe that this message is for some of you this morning. That this message is, is like God saying, wake up. Get ready. Get serious. Get serving me. Now. God spoke in your heart. You know your heart. I don't. As your pastor, I will be faithful in bringing the word of God to you. The Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and convicting you of any area in your life that is not right. And you get it right today. Whatever area of your life that is not right with Him, then you get it right today. God's will give you opportunities to serve Him and you can say, no, I'm not too busy, too tired. We can go through multiple excuses of why we shouldn't serve God, or why we shouldn't do certain things that He's calling us to do. The excuses can be endless. But those excuses aren't going to hold up before the King of Kings. At the judgment seat of Christ. They're not going to hold up. They're not going to wash. God knows our hearts. He knows our motivations. He knows our desires. God speaking to your heart this morning. Any area that you need to get right with Him, then you come forward and I'll pray. And now may the peace of God be the process of all that to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May the joy of the Lord, one of the crowns, crown of rejoicing, may the joy of the Lord sustain us. Through the challenging times with his children or, or with others that we work with, may your joy sustain us, Lord, in this coming week of the challenges we will face. May we continue to rejoice in you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.